Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. You made it back and here we go. Guys, we're gonna take a look, not at the Eighth Amendment so much as the issue of the death penalty as it stands in the United States today. We'll take you through a little bit of the history in terms of judicial activism, um, the Supreme Court and rulings on it, especially if you're an AP government, if you're studying it for college or law or something like that, or you're cray cray on the internet, it doesn't matter. But at the end, we wanna know what you think. Should the United States have a strict death penalty or is it unconstitutional? Let's find out. So today, the death penalty is legal in 32 of the 50 United States. We're going to take a look uh, in a second at the two big Supreme Court decisions, Furman versus Georgia and Gregg versus Georgia, coming out of the 1970s. But prior to that, even if we go back to colonial times, English common law, uh, the death penalty was legal in all 13 colonies and not just for murder, for lots of different reasons. Um, in fact, in 1608, Captain George Kendall became the first person in the United States, well, in the Americas, executed in Jamestown. Uh, being accused of being a Spanish spy. And from that period on, it was pretty much commonplace in the colonies and then later in the early states, a few states were um, kind of opting out. But really, I want to talk about more kind of modern day. And I think that we really need to start in 1972. Prior to 1972, there was a pretty good execution rate in the United States with most states implementing the death penalty and that being up really to the prosecutor in terms of when to go after that charge. And in many cases, the jury would come back with a guilty verdict and it was presupposed that person was going to get the death penalty. And there was a lot of questions about prosecutorial discretion in terms of why certain prosecutors would go after certain people and not other certain people. And of course, there was a, uh, a racial element to that. So in 1972, the Supreme Court kind of put the brakes on it. And remember, you have to know the Eighth Amendment. And of course, if you don't know the Eighth Amendment, it's really quick. There's a video right there. I don't know who made that video. You can watch the video. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. So, that language, the Supreme Court has never ruled means you can't have the death penalty. It's called selective incorporation in the sense that the Supreme Court has never selectively incorporated really the uh, cruel and unusual punishment to the death penalty in the states. It's really up to the states. But in 1972, in Furman versus Georgia, they did put a halt to all executions. And in fact, anybody that was on death row at that point was taken off death row. You know, someone like Charles Manson, who got the death penalty for um, being involved in the murders in California in the 1960s, he was, you know, put onto life with parole because of Furman versus Georgia. But basically what the Supreme Court said is there's too many inconsistencies. You know, there is kind of this racial element. It's really unfair, we think, in terms of the process that is leading some people to get to the death penalty. So, uh, yo mama, you need to stop doing it that way basically saying that it could be legal, but you really had to come up with some kind of methodology. And the states began to do that um, right away. Greg versus Georgia becomes the trial case really on you know, trying to overturn Furman or to say we fixed our problem. And basically what they did was they said in Greg versus Georgia, well, look, Georgia has reformed itself. And now what they're doing is they're giving the defendant a chance to argue his case in a second phase of punishment. So rather than it being kind of automatic, there is this element of giving the person, you know, mitigating circumstances, you know, whatever they may be. Maybe the kid had a rough childhood. We're not going to get into that right now. But certainly in 1976, it was kind of fair game at this point for the states to revise themselves, revise themselves, and to start the death penalty up again. From 1976 to 1984, I believe there's only like 10 or 11 executions, and really this is because of the writ of habeas corpus. The uh, defense for these people on death row is really using the judicial system to clog it up, to slow them down, to appeal on everything, and just judicially, we're not getting those executions done. And in 1984, you have Reagan in there for four years, and you have a lot more kind of strict uh, you know, law and order types of judges, and that begins to kind of loosen those clogs. So from 19 
1984 to 2006, we have nearly 1,400 executions, Texas leading the pack with over a third of those. So let's take a look, and that's really where we're at. And you know, I'm not going to say that executions um, aren't slowed down. In fact, in 2013, I think there's 3,088 people on death row, and we only executed 39. So that's only a 2%. So there's a lot of people that are going to argue out there that one of the reasons it's not a deterrent is because it's still clogged up in the judicial system. We still have two exceptions to talk about because you ain't going to be executing the kitties and you ain't going to be executing the crazy. So I take the cray cray comment back because certainly there are people with mental deficiencies, people with really low IQs that aren't operating on the same kind of plane as everybody else. And Atkins versus Virginia, this is 2002, the Supreme Court begins to put restrictions on who you can have the death penalty for. And we'll talk a little bit about one of the restrictions being that it needs to be first degree murder. Well, uh, child rape and rape generally, that were states that were executing people for that, and that's not going to be allowed. That's Kennedy versus Louisiana, 2008, where they had a law that said, you know, if you raped a child, you know, you can get the death penalty. That's our judgment. And the court has said that that would be cruel and unusual because it's not homicide. Non-homicide is kind of exempted. But again, Atkins versus Virginia, that's your vocab kids in school, 2002, puts the number at 70. If you have a, you know, scored IQ lower than 70, you can't be executed because you are deemed to be mentally incompetent of uh, standing uh, for that crime with a death penalty. And then you have Roper versus Simmons, that's 2005, which puts a halt to executing anybody who committed a crime under the age of 18. So the day before you're 18, if you, you know, you do what you do when you kill somebody, you can't be executed for it. But don't celebrate your birthday doing that because then you're going down like a clown. Those are the really basic restrictions. And there are laws. There's the Drug Kingpin Act that actually um, has made it you know, legal to go after high-level drug offenders and get the death penalty. But that's never been done and that's never been challenged in the Supreme Court. But right now, we do have the idea it has to be first degree. It has to be homicide. You can't execute kids. You can't execute the mentally disabled, but everybody else is fair game, at least for the 32 states that have it legal. But I would like to kind of lay out what are the issues that we would like to talk about down in the comments, and then uh, give you up. Be done with the I think the biggest question is, you know, is it constitutional? And of course the Supreme um. Court has ruled it constitutional, therefore it is constitutional. But certainly we can spare for some interpretations, you know, um, cruel and unusual. And certainly some people are going to say that um, it is neither, and some are going to say that it's both. But you could talk about that down in the comments below, certainly. And then the biggest arguments, of course, you know, is it a deterrent? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we have it, and supposedly in some of the states, is to say, you know, this is what's going to happen if you do it, so don't do that. And some people are going to argue that it is a deterrent, and other people are going to say, you know, people aren't thinking about that when they go to kill somebody. And then certainly there is this kind of eye for an eye, justice, Hammurabi's code kind of thing. Is it justice? Is that what should happen? You know, there's people that are going to say, of course, that's ethical, that's moral. And other people are probably going to say, you know, you know we're a civilized society. Civilized societies don't do that. You know, what other civilized society executes people other than the United States? And you can discuss that in the comments down below. We also want to talk about the forms of the death penalty. And right now, it really is up to the states. There's even been, um, I don't think any of the states use it, but recently some states, I think it was Washington, which was still using the firing squad. The electric chair has kind of gone out of fashion. That was the preferred method before like the 1990s when really we started using a three-drug cocktail lethal injection. And recently, uh, Clayton Darrell Lockett in Oklahoma suffered, I believe it was 40 minutes before he finally had a heart attack from that drug cocktail. And right now, Bayes versus Rees, 2008, is the guiding Supreme Court decision, which really finds that not to be cruel and unusual. So I think that's another point to be made. Is the form of the death penalty important? Is this three-drug cocktail something that's over the limit? Should be the question of whether or not form of punishment um, that takes 40 minutes to die where you're convulsing and it's quite painful, um, 
some people would consider that to be cruel and unusual and other people won't. So we want to hear from you about that one as well. But whatever it's going to be, it's going to be. Because certainly it's controversial and certainly it's important to have an opinion based on the Constitution, the words itself, your life experiences, and the facts in your head. And reason. So there you go, guys. Giddy up for the learning. This is Hip Hughes. I only have one more thing to say. You see those guys? Those guys are from Miss Freitag's class in North Tama County Community School District that's in Traer, Iowa. And uh, we had a great Skype session with these guys. They asked really great questions and uh, we grew our great, great brains together. So if you're interested in having me maybe do a Skype with you, a Google Hangout with you, uh, just give me a contact. I'm on the Twitters right there, at Hip Hughes, or you can email me. Uh, hip Hughes at Gmail, or you probably just can think it really loudly in your head and maybe I'll hear it. Where attention goes, energy flows, guys. Make sure if you haven't subscribed to Hip Hughes History, you do so right now by pressing the fun red button right over my shoulder. You're not going to want to not do it because it's big and it's red and it's shiny. So giddy up for the learning again, guys. I'm done singing giddy up. We'll see you next time. Did you press the button?